always uh, have a different theme, and we invite local speakers who are doing really cool things to talk a little bit about who they are and what they do. Our theme tonight is villains, which I'm really excited about. I hope you are too. Ooh, yeah. Uh, this man is uh, in the midst of earning his PhD at uh, Boston University in Hollywood cinema and film theory. His focus, though, is on uh, the, the, the uh, sort of outsider artists of the Hollywood system to a certain extent. We'll talk about that a little bit, but he also uh, will tell us a little bit about some theories about villains on the big screen uh, and different types of archetypal villains, how they differ, and uh, where they are kind of the same and what that means for us as audiences. So please welcome to the stage, if you can, soon to be future Dr. Frankie Venaria. So I was born in 1989, which was the year that Tim Burton's first Batman movie was released. <laughs> Which has meant that for all of my almost 30 years, my mind has just been melted by superhero and villains. So, so much so that I teach a class on superhero movies at BU. But what I want to do tonight is take sort of a, a wider look at what villains mean to Hollywood, what villains mean to audiences. And I want to talk about two kinds of villain archetypes that Hollywood likes to give us uh, and that mean different things and function in different ways. They do overlap, so I don't want to say that these are entirely opposites, but I think that they bear sort of talking about in different kinds of ways. One is what I would call a moral villain, and the other is a political villain. And I'll start with the moral villain first and then say a bit about the political one after. So the moral villain is maybe in like pop psychology terms, what we would sort of understand as the villain that allows us to, as audiences, vicariously, voyeuristically, cathartically perhaps, uh, enjoy like the antisocial, destructive, taboo things that are generally seen as like antithetical to society's norms, to what we would think of as a social good. And this kind of villain, this moral villain, l takes a lot of different forms in different films and over the years, but one of the places that we can trace this back to is Hollywood genre movies in the 1930s and specifically with two genres, the gangster genre and the horror genre. And what is really important about these genres and when they're made is that whether you are looking at something like The Public Enemy, Little Caesar, uh, the original Scarface, these were sort of the early run of gangster movies, uh, you are dealing with characters who could kill, could steal, could do any number of things, and sort of your enjoyment of the movie was dependent on the fact that they were doing these things that sort of like the Joker, or at least some forms of the Joker, are not okay. But where the sort of structure, or where there's a kind of catch to this, is that with the gangster movie, you know or you expect that the gangster is not going to get away with it. That there's going to be some kind of moral logic that says evil can't win in the end. Which had meant, certainly in the 30s and after, that the gangster had to be defeated somehow, some way, killed, arrested, Part of this was industrial and had to do with something called the Hayes Code or the Production Code at the time, which was a form, I can say more about this later, but was a form of self-censorship that Hollywood had imposed on itself that basically necessitated very restrictive moral and moralized endings so that a gangster couldn't win. Same exact thing applied to horror movies. 
specifically monster movies like Frankenstein, like Dracula, Werewolf, Mummy, what have you. Our sort of enjoyment from these movies comes from the fact that the monster, like the gangster, stands outside of society, is similarly a threat to social norms. The reason that we get excitement, suspense, pleasure, whatever we sort of take out of the horror movie, we get that because the monster threatens the characters on the screen. We might fear for them and we might fear for ourselves, but our enjoyment of the movie has sort of that idea of we're seeing something that can't nor sh can or should not be done in normal society. Again, with this catch that the monster has to be defeated. There are many different kinds of moral villains. This is something that carries on after um, the 30s. Takes a lot of different forms. Obviously, gangster and uh, horror movies change and sort of become less moralizing in their own ways. But that's at least one place that we can sort of trace this logic back to or trace this idea of a moral villain back to. As far as a political villain is concerned, this really arises out of Hollywood's desire to comment, address an actual or perceived political, social, economic problem that actually exists in the world. And this problem tends to be one that requires just massive restructuring of society, massive restructuring of power and economic power, political and economic power, social power, etc. Hollywood is averse to that. Does not like to make movies that promote this kind of a message that would sort of ask that society change too much. So what Hollywood will do is it will look at a problem and say, well, rather than looking at everything in society in terms of politics, in terms of economics that would need to change to actually fix this problem, let's individualize it. Let's make this a hero versus villain story so that the villain in this case ends up representing that political problem, either as the cause of it or as somehow representative or affected by it, but nevertheless always some kind of scapegoat or avatar of it. And the logic will go for Hollywood that this political villain represents such an extreme that the villain becomes the problem. The actual political, social, economic problem, that's sort of forgotten about. You have to beat the bad guy. The bigger issue sort of falls by the wayside. One movie that's sort of a very good demonstration of this is Black Panther, which I'm sure folks have seen, right? Hands, seen it. So, very good. In that movie, uh, Killmonger is the political villain. He identifies an actual political problem, which is the global oppression of black lives. He, though he is presented as the villain in that movie because his solution to that problem is black revolution, black liberation, and even more poignantly and disturbingly for Hollywood, black empire. Hollywood can't have that or it doesn't want to promote that message. So the way that that movie works is that Killmonger becomes the front and center political problem and the political villain. 
global racism, global oppression, we'll deal with that some other way. And we'll give you a more palatable version of dealing with racism that isn't really gonna solve anything, which is just building community centers is like the most, is what that movie sort of says, is how you fix this, which not quite sure that will do it. And to just provide a little bit of context on like, this political villain is not a new construction. Folks have, I'm sure, heard of Birth of a Nation, right? Extremely racist, uh, white supremacist propaganda movie. It is very different from Black Panther, so I don't want to say that they're the same movie or to flatten like the meaningful differences between them, but the message of Birth of a Nation is that black people should not be free. Getting rid of slavery was a mistake. And in fact, if you give black people any sort of rights that are even modestly equal to whites, if you give them political representation, that's the same thing as them taking over the country and just destroying society. So while different than Black Panther, both movies sort of represent Hollywood's tendency to not really want to endorse massive radical changes, even if these might be good things. And I can say more about um, political villains and different forms they take. Uh, post 9-11, uh, political villain means something very particular and still carries a very heated racial component to it. But um, that's maybe something that I can talk about later. I don't want to, I, there's an interview um, bit that I would also like to talk about and talk about some more things. So. Thoughts, deep thoughts. All right, uh, few, few things I want to ask about. Um, number one, are, is, is it exclusive? Are there, are there sort of, are there instances where we have the hybrid villain who can be a little of one, a little of the other, kind of all rolled up into one? Sure, so yes. Uh, the place where this happens, I would say, is film noir, which comes about in the 40s. The reason for this is that this film noir takes root after World War II is when it really takes off and becomes popular. And sort of the way that it's understood in film historian terms is that was sort of a reactionary response to changing social dynamics at the time. Because you had, during the war and after, women who had entered the workforce and sort of gained their own sense of economic stability and independence while their husbands uh, were away. And this was something that returning veterans sort of, this was a new reality and a new social dynamic that veterans were not used to because things were different when, when they had left. So film noir with the femme fatale represents a political villain in that the woman who destroys the man, that is the sort of logic of at least early film noir, sort of represents this new political, economic mobility and freedom for women. Dangers of women, exactly. dangers of women. At right. the same time, what's, what's interesting about this is that she's obviously a very sexualized figure. And this is sort of where the male sort of anxiety and sort of sense of emasculation gets projected onto this figure. So that's where you have the moral component as well. Um, Characters are meant to die in these movies, um, too. So. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Um, all right, I want to play a little game. Now, I know, I know, you know, I, I have a ton of friends who are in academia, mm. and I interview a lot of people, and, and folks who know their topics really well have a tendency to sort of equivocate, and like, you know, most of the time it's like, well, it's, the answer is always more complicated than that. But I want to play a little game where I'm going to throw out a villain, mm. And just off the top of your head, I want you to say whether they're a moral villain or a political villain. I'll take some 
ideas from the crowd. Let's go Darth Vader. Uh, moral. Moral villain. Uh, give me a villain, people. Clyde what? Clyde Barrow. Clyde Barrow. Political. Political. Dracula. Moral. Moral. Dick Cheney. <laughs> Dick Cheney and Vice. <laughs> Political. <laughs> the Terminator. Moral. Moral. Any other villains we want to know about? Ursula. Ursula. Moral. Moral. Magneto. Political. Political. All right. Any others? Scarlett O'Hara. Moral. Moral. Also impressive that you know every one of these characters, right? <laughs> Good job by you. Like, we could really be, we could be setting you up for failure, yeah. but you're nailing it. Uh, any others? Scrooge. Moral. Moral. All right. So uh, I, I kind of want to close with this because we, we, we were playing a little bit sort of this game. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was asking about this before we came out, and I brought, up, um, I brought up the movie Silence of the Lambs. And I was sort of trying to get my head around this idea of the moral villain, um, you know, kind of as someone who's, I was like, is it just somebody who's just sort of inherently evil or what have you? And I asked about Hannibal Lecter. And you had a fascinating response about that movie in that Hannibal Lecter's not the only villain in that movie. Mm -hmm. So talk us through what you told me about this, which I, which I think is fascinating. Sure. So Lecter would be a moral villain. Like, a lot of our enjoyment of the movie is, like, that he's just so... You, he's so evil and you're and so... And charismatic. And very charismatic. Like, that's, like, the pleasure, is that Hopkins does such a good job of playing him and he's meant to really entice you. There is, however, a political villain in that movie. Anyone just not think outside? Who, who is like the... Who else is a bad guy in that movie? Buffalo, Buffalo Bill. Bill. Political villain. Political villain because Bill is gay, Bill is trans, Bill is a transvestite. We're not from our sort of now understanding, I'm not sure exactly how we would understand this framework, but Demi, when he made that movie, was criticized by LGBTQ groups because he seemed to equate serial killer pathology with some form of queerness, some form of being sort of outside of the heterosexual cisgendered norm. So Bill is that political problem or that political, like, the idea that from the movie is that these people are bad people. And Demi actually, when the next movie that he made, anyone know? Tell us. Philadelphia. Philadelphia was obviously where you have Tom Hanks playing a character dying of AIDS, meant to be Demi's apology for having done a very anti-queer sort of movie and saying through Denzel Washington's character, sorry that I messed up, I actually do like these people and they actually are people. So that's a little bit of how that a movie can have, if a character doesn't sort of conflate the two kinds of villains, then a movie can sort of have more than one villain that means more than one thing. Frankie Venaria, everybody, let's hear it for him. Who watches television? Everybody watches television, especially in this day and age. It's kind of become the, the sort of cultural uh, currency of the 21st century in a way. Uh, even more to some extent than novels or films, I would say. Uh, but this man, you might have read his work in a local rag called the Boston Globe. Let's please put your hands together for Mr. Matthew Gilbert. Matthew, how long have you been doing what you do? Uh, and, and then how long have you been doing it at the Globe? Well, I've been at the Globe for 31 years, so. I know you're all thinking, what? he doesn't look like he's that old. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, for about 10 years, I did books and movies, and then I moved to TV in 98 which a lot of people thought, uh, TV, you're gonna cover TV, really, do you wanna do that? 
well. And I was kind of like, eh. And then the next year, The Sopranos premiered. And my life's been a breeze since then. It's been great. So uh, one of the, uh, you're, you're sort of, you're hinting at it there. Um, yes. But um, during one of the breaks, uh, one of the folks here came up to me and said, you know, earlier you, you sort of said we're in this golden age of television. And I've heard many people say it. And he was like, what, you know, what, what, what does that mean? What is, what is it about television today that is a golden age? So as somebody who is digesting it in the way you are, is that accurate, people referring Absolutely. to it today yeah. as a golden age of television? And what does that mean and why is it happening? Okay. I mean, I think a lot of people in the business, especially in the criticism business, might argue that we are now beyond yeah, the golden we, age. Yeah, we've kind of jumped okay. the shark a little bit, to use a the television bit, term. <laughs> you know, that the best shows now don't equal the best shows of, you know, 5, 10, 15 years ago. But come on, it's still a golden age. I mean, there's so much good beep out there. And, uh, you know, um, I think it just means that TV, you know, has become, it's always been a writer's medium, and now writers are really killing it, and the cinematographers are coming along, and the directors are coming along, the actors are coming over, and it's, I would argue right now, t you know, TV as a medium is better than movies. Um, what, what are thoughts? Do we agree with that? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's probably right. Is, is so, it... ha ha, and all of you people who thought <laughs> I was crazy for becoming a TV critic. Well done, well timed. Good foresight on your part. Yeah. Is, it, is this a function of, is it, what, it, what is this a function of? I mean, I guess it's complex, right? You have cable yeah. taking some chances, and, but is it also, I mean, is it, is it because Netflix is streaming? Has the cost no. come down? Like what, like, what is it? Here's what I think it is. I think it's two things. First of all, it's just a business model shift, okay? Back in the old days when there was only network TV, advertisers were very powerful. You know, and advertisers didn't want their products advertised on shows that were kind of mean or negative. They didn't want their products identified with something kind of ugly. Um, so there was a kind of pressure for networks to keep things upbeat and to keep things simple for you know the least common denominator. So you had good guys and bad guys, black and white. You know it was simple as can be. You had Leave It to Beaver. You had you know I mean compare Marcus Welby if any of you are old enough to remember him to you know Doctor House. You know I mean Marcus Welby was like dad, grandpa. You know. So I think there was a business element when cable, when The Sopranos came out, and it became clear that you know, audiences actually do crave reality. They want grayness. They want their villains to, you know, to resemble real people. They want, um, they want to see real life up on the screen, and, or on the little screen, or on the big screen in your den, or whatever you want to call it. So um, I think that was a big shift. I think everybody woke up and thought, wait a minute. We thought audiences couldn't handle, you know, negativity and Tony Soprano and, you know, ugly things and people who are good guys but then do horrible things and horrible people who do good things. People can't handle that. And The Sopranos opened everybody's eyes. I mean, there were hints, there were clues before that. Hill Street Blues or... And even more so, NYPD Blue with Andy Sipowitz, yeah, yeah. you know, was a precursor to Tony Soprano in some ways. Is some of it as simple as, I mean, I mean you just, you sort, of, you sort of blasted through it there, but you went like, you know, on the big screen or on the small screen in your right. house, whatever. But just right. like, you know, this coincides with a time where a 40-inch plasma screen comes right. down in price and everybody goes from having sort of square tube TVs to these sort of widescreen 40-inch televisions that has penetration in the program. Something as simple as that, does that add to this like fuel to the fire of this happening? Absolutely. That brings the cinematographers over, that allows the storytelling to be more visual because you Absolutely. have these beautiful screens? Yes, yeah. definitely. Um, you know, cinematographers like, you know, Breaking Bad, I mean, look at that show. I don't know if any of you have seen it, 
but I mean, it's spectacular. She likes it. You're, you're just Look like, at, thank right? God you talked I mean, about it. Every shot, especially after the first season, they changed cinematographers and it, it just went up to ne the next level. And every shot on that show is amazing. Or, so, or Mad Men, I think of as well. Mad Men, sort of like a, take pause it at any point, and it's a pain. Yeah. Right? So there was the there was the the business model that shifted, but then I think also culturally, people were ready for realness on screen. I think there was a hunger for to see something other than you know, good by, good guys going up against bad guys. And I think you know maybe I don't know what that's from. That's from you know, the news media expanding and everybody seeing the world as it is more than they used to back in the 50s when, you know, we had Leave it to Beaver. You know, suddenly people wanted to see gray. So, you know, you mentioned The Sopranos as, you know, there was hints before, but that being a real game changer. Uh, what makes Tony Soprano work as a character? And is, is it, like, g give us a sense of why he is groundbreaking. I think he challenged the audience morally. You know, when you're watching a good guy who's really, really good and a bad guy who's really, really awful, there's no moral, you don't have to ask yourself questions. It's good and bad. Tony Soprano made you ask lots of questions like, is he horrible? He's trying to get better. He's in therapy. We, you know, it's a psychological show, so we got to see the root of his pathology or his uh, sociopath? No, wait. What's the uh, sociopathology? sociopathology. Yeah. 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 Um. You know, we so suddenly he was more sympathetic. I can't say that he was redeemed, really, but by anything that he did, and certainly not in the end. But he, he he made us ask ourselves why we were drawn to him and why we wanted to pay attention to him and why he was so interesting. And I think that was the key to the end of the show. Sorry, I'm schwitzing. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, you know, and I don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't seen The Sopranos, but if you haven't seen The Sopranos, pfft, whatever. Um, you know, it, the screen went black. I'm sure you all know that. And, and I felt that we were... It was David Chase, the creator of the show, basically saying, you decide. Does he get killed? Does he live? Is he going to be punished for what he did? Do you think he should be punished? You know, I think it was more of the same throwing the moral weight onto the viewer and asking us to think it through. And Yeah. So we're tiptoeing around this a little bit, but let's, let's talk about... He, he sort of becomes... Yeah, yeah get, get comfortable. Yeah. Get yourself comfortable. <laughs> um, he sort of stands out and, and is sort of this groundbreaking moment, and then we see on the heels of that over the next maybe eight years, this idea of the anti-hero really rising in popularity, specifically vis-a-vis -vis television, right. right? Right. What's going on here? I just think part of it is market. You know, the, the Sopranos did really well. It, it's, it brought people to the, into the world of cable. You know, prior to the Sopranos, a very small group of people were going to cable. You know, there were people who would go for Oz or, um, you know, the Larry Sanders show. I mean, there was good stuff, but... The Sopranos opened it up. Suddenly, a lot of people were willing to go to those weird numbers on their dial. And um, so there was a market component where everybody wanted to kind of jump on that bandwagon. But I also think it was just so good that, that the writers out there realized we don't have to just go to movies to do this. Because movies were ahead of TV in terms of anti-heroes. Yeah, I mean, you know, you know. Tony Soprano, you know, obviously it's different and you have a different timeline, but... You know, you think about The Godfather, and right, it's, exactly. it's kind of the same thing, right? Absolutely. Like, it's like a guy you sort of understand. You right. see his whole... Ba in Godfather 2, you learn his whole background. Exactly. You sympathize with him. Yes, the movies were ahead of, you know, television on that level. But once television got there, everybody, all the writers ran to it. I mean, imagine if you're a writer, you get to develop this story over time. You know, you can get into the details, you can develop all kinds of characters, and, uh, you know, suddenly everybody was trying to get into serial 
storytelling, and they still are. I mean, it's it's a crowded, or it's not crowded because there's so much space, but everybody's there now. I mean, all the movie stars are there. You know, every day I read about some new movie star who's doing a TV series. Um, yeah. Who are some of the the villains that stand out for you? You know, over this period. So let, let's kind of. It, it, Let's scope it for now from kind of post Tony Soprano through to today. Yeah. Who are who are some of these sort of standout villains? But as you suggest in television, they're they're sort of more anti heroes. They're sort of the villain is the good guy or the villain is the main character. Yeah. Kind of thing. What what are some standout? Yeah, because examples? you know on those shows they do have flat out villains. Yeah. I mean on The Sopranos, I mean there are some evil, horrible, unredeeming. Um, unredemptive guys, you know. Um, so, like moral uh, villains as opposed to political villains, uh, mostly, right? I don't know. Let's ask Frankie. Know. Where's Frankie? <laughs> Frankie, are you um, with us? Yeah, he's with us. Frankie's with us. But uh, wait, I'm sorry. So, so you were saying that yeah. there, you know, some of these shows. I, I, I had asked about like I some, watched too, too, too much TV. My yeah, brain you're is scrambled. You're literally writing a <laughs> review true. for tomorrow in your head while you're talking to us. Yeah. Um, um, oh, so, yeah, so I feel like, you know, um, but then there were people like Greg, Dr. House, you know, and yeah. um, obviously Walter White from Breaking Bad and uh, uh, Frank, Underwood. Frank Underwood from yeah. House of Cards. Guess what? I wrote a list. Oh, nicely done. Omar from The Wire. Omar from The Wire, The Wire is a great example because that's a show where, you know, some of these people are doing horrible things, but the show is reminding us over and over again that they are victims of broken systems, you know, that that Omar, and Omar actually, you know, was sort of a Robin Hood figure too, but a lot of those people were, um, you know, we were being asked not to hate them, I think. Yeah. Um, okay, here's my list. Uh, of, uh, all right, I'm sorry. I wrote a list of pure villains and then the anti-heroes. So the pure villain, villains are people like Ramsey Bolton and Joffrey from Game of Thrones, uh -huh. Nina, uh, Vern Sch Schillinger on Oz. But then here's, here's my list of anti-heroes. Vic Mackey from The Shield. Huh. I don't know if anyone watched yeah, that. Yeah. You know, a, a really bad cop. Um, Dexter. I mean, uh, Dexter yeah. was like yep. so a clearly serial that, killer. You know? I mean, a serial yeah. killer, but only killing people who were killers. So you know, um, Don Draper, uh, uh, Nucky Thompson from uh, the Boardwalk Empire, which is a great show. The yeah. Jennings, both of them from uh, uh, the Americans. Um, ben Linus from Lost. Uh, Serena Joy, right now on The Handmaid's Tale. Very complicated, um, and that's a great show. Um, Luther, Idris Elba's uh -huh. Luther. So that was my list. There's more, but... Um, you know, there's a few things you just touched on that I want to talk about. Talk to me about the difference between the pure villain and the anti-hero. Well, the pure villain, you know, I think pure villains come in handy because they can give a show an arc. You know, you can have a season with Jip Rossetti on... Boardwalk Empire, where he's just evil, you know? But it's hard to do a whole full series with a straight-out villain, you know? I mean, a whole series of Ramsey Bolton from Game of Thrones, I mean, ugh. you know, he's a rapist, he cuts off genitals, he's, you know, evil, evil, evil. So I think, you know, there's a place for those straight villains, but um, if you really want a show that's going to challenge the viewer and bring them in and ask them to identify with this immoral villain and parse it themselves, um, you need somebody much more complex. Do you, do, you, do you need the pure villain to soften the anti-hero? That's a great question. I think they, you, the writers will do that, absolutely. You know, they'll like have present somebody so evil. Right. That you kind of go, ah, Tony Soprano's not that right, bad, actually. Right, right exactly. Yeah. Well, like Joey Pants on Sopranos, you know, just horrible, 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 over and over again. So Tony was like the same guy compared to him. Tony kept his shit together, you know. Um, so, uh, yes, absolutely, I think that's true. 
So the other thing, uh, and I, I assume there is a very complicated answer to this, but most of these anti-heroes are men. Right, exactly, which is um, fascinating. And so what's the, what's the deal there? <sighs> it's very complicated. Um, is yeah, that just like, mo you know. like most protagonists just happen to be men? So even when we go to anti-heroes, we're... If that's the new style of protagonist, of course, most of those are going to be men. I think that's a piece of it. Um, I also think there is uh, a fear among um, some writers of demonizing women, um, you know, and alienating audiences for that. Um, and, uh, you know, I... I but yes, I, I, it's complicated. It's very complicated. Are I'll, there good female anti-heroes out well, there? Well, yes. Um, we had talked, Edgar and I, and I, I was going to come up with some under, uh, under known or lesser known uh, anti-heroes. And, and, and my primary one is uh, Nurse Jackie. Um, has anyone here seen that? Who watches no. Nurse Jackie? Oh, my show God. Show hands. I mean, what Curious. an amazing show. Female, female, you know? female, female. Guys, how many guys watch Nurse Jackie? Yeah. This is actually Come interesting. Come on, guys. Yeah, you know, some Fewer. It's, it's huh. over, but it's, it's an amazing show. And, you know, Edie Falco reinvented her, herself as an actress on TV for that show. And she, she's at the top for me. Um, but... She plays basically a drug addict who's married and has two kids. It's the perfect life. She's, she, they live in Brooklyn or wherever near New York, and she works in New York City, and she's a great nurse, and she is just a crazy pill addict. And in her hunger for drugs, she basically screws her husband and her children and herself. Um, but it's an amazing show. Um, when Edie Falco won an Emmy as Best Actress in a Comedy, she got up on stage and said, thank you, you're so great, but it's not a comedy. And she was right, you know? I mean, that's a whole, we can have a whole uh, event around that, you know? The whole uh, sort of category problem these days with yeah. these awards, you know, on television where, you know, you've got comedies and dramas, I don't think so. I mean, so many of the shows that I watch now are half-hour dramas like Homecoming with Julia Roberts or, you know, um, or hour-long dramedies. You know, they're just, it's, uh, the definitions have all changed and, and cat, uh, the award shows for TV really need to address that. Would but, you but, would you characterize you know now actually now that we're talking about this now I'm thinking about it would you like I'm thinking about uh, the Claire Danes character in Homeland yes. she's kind of an anti-hero ish maybe ish ish I mean she's a super flawed individual she's super who we flawed pull for. but she's always on the moral high ground wouldn't you say I mean almost always even when she does something behind people's backs she's still you know, doing it for the greater good, and she, you know, it's a, it's a good point, but I, I don't know, I, I suppose you could come at it from either side, but I tend to think she's not quite an anti-hero. Uh, the only other sort of obvious female anti-hero I can come up with is uh, Glenn Close in Damages, which was uh, started on FX and then moved to, I don't know where, oh, Direct TV. Um, but yeah, uh, that, that's about it. I mean, it's been slow. It's been slow All right. for women. Uh, I could sit here and talk to you for another 20 minutes, but yeah. we got to wrap it up. So okay. uh, I know our theme is villains, but we've talked plenty about it. And since I have a, a TV critic here, give me a couple of shows that I might not be watching that uh, I should be watching. Give us a, a few tips. It's so funny when you say watching because I'm like, it could be something that's ended already. Sure. But, you know, it doesn't that's matter the, to me. That's the way me. it works now. Yeah. People will come up to me and say, oh, I just caught up with such and such from, you know, 10 years ago. And because it's still there. It's right on Netflix. You know, it's not like, you know. So what are some great shows that um, you love well, that maybe we have Well, when I was thinking of antiheroes, I thought also of another medical personal personage uh, in addition to Jackie, and that's from The Nick. Uh, it's a show, it was a three-season show uh, by Steven Soderbergh, I believe he wrote and did the and cinematography wow. and directed. It was an amazing show with Clive Owen. It was on Cinemax, which is a sort of corporate relative to... Did you see it? 
um, corporate so relative to also HBO. Give the thumbs An up, amazing Nick. show. I mean, ab- oh yeah, about a guy, you know, a doctor in the year 1900 who's a drug addict like House, but really wants to push medicine forward. It wants to push surgery forward, even though he's a mess. But that's a great show. Sounds I really awesome. recommend that. Yeah. Um, Any yeah. others? Yeah, so many, you know. So many. Talk to yeah, him after before the, you get out of here. Yeah. Let's hear it from Matthew Gilbert, everybody. And thanks to everybody for coming out tonight. Thanks for participating in trivia. If you'd like on your way out the door, don't forget we are a public meeting.